There are two principles the Buddha said are most conducive to awakening. One is admirable friendship, and the other is appropriate attention. Admirable friendship, the Buddha said, is the most, most important external condition. And appropriate attention is the most important internal condition. The Buddha has a lot to say about friendship, and often the issue of who you hang around with lies at the very beginning of many of his descriptions of the path. You try to find someone reliable, someone you can trust. Because we pick up our knowledge, not only our knowledge, but also our habits from the people we hang out with. So you want to look for someone who would not make false claims to knowledge out of greed, aversion, or delusion, or who would recommend to other people that they do things that are in those people's not best interests. That are no that sort of thing about someone, you have to watch them carefully. So you have to be careful about who you make friends with, because sometimes it's only over time that you see the qualities of the people you're hanging out with. This is why in the Buddhist teachings you don't make a life-term commitment to any teacher. You watch the person, and you let the person watch you. When you find somebody you trust, the Buddha says, try to be open to their criticism, because that's the only way that they'll be willing to really teach you frankly. If you show a resistance to criticism, they'll just close up. So the fact that someone says nice things to you doesn't mean that that's a good friend, or that someone says harsh things doesn't mean that it's a bad friend. Sometimes the truth is harsh. You have to look at the underlying motivation. And also, what happens when you follow what the other person says? But again, it's not just what the person says. You want to look for a person whose habits are good. The Buddha said you pick up lots of different things from the people you associate with. He has a list, one point, of seven qualities you want to look for in a person to decide whether that's a person you want to respect. And the implication here is also that you want to learn those qualities from the person you respect. Two of them have to do with the Dharma, in other words, knowing what the Dharma is and what the meaning of the Dharma is. That kind of thing can be passed along in words. But there are five other qualities which you can talk about in general terms, but you can't really pass the knowledge along in terms of words. You have to watch your friend in action over time. One is having a sense of yourself, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what kind of tasks are appropriate for you to do, what are the kind of tasks are appropriate you leave to other people. Having a sense of enough, this is really important, because much of our lives is driven by a sense that we don't have enough. And if we have friends who have a very high standard of how wealthy you have to be in order to have enough. In other words, lots and lots and lots of stuff, then you're going to be spending most of your life running after the stuff. You want to find someone who has a healthy attitude towards things, how much you really need, how much you really need to work in order to get those material things, so that you can have time left over, so not all, not all of your life is given to your job. But you actually have time to look after your own mind, time to find some solitude. That relates to another quality you want to pick up, is a sense of the right time and place for things. What's the right time to speak? What's the right time to be quiet? When something has to be said, what's the right time to say it? This is something you really have to be sensitive to as you deal with other people. Because sometimes you, there may be things that you want to talk about that you know the other person is going to be resistant to. How do you find a way to talk about it in such a way that they lower their resistance? 
who else is going to be around when you're talking? How rested are they? Do they feel well fed? Do they feel secure in their trust of you? You really have to look at these things so that your words will be more effective. You also want to have a sense of how you behave in different kinds of groups of people, how you behave at work, how you behave at home, how you behave with your close friends, how you behave in different levels of society, how you speak. This is something you have to observe. And there's finally having a sense of how to judge people. What kind of people should you hang out with, and what kind of people are setting a bad example? This is one of the reasons why when the Buddha set up the monastic Sangha, he set it up as an apprenticeship. You spend time with your teacher and pick up these things. So when, when you're trained, you're not trained just in the words, or not just in the texts, but you're trained in an all-around way. Because these external friends you have tend to become internal voices in your mind. And for most of us, who's our internal voice? Who's our internal friend? The Buddha said, we go around, most of us, with craving as our companion. And so where is our companion leading us? Hopefully, at the present moment, our craving is focused on doing something skillful, training the mind, getting a handle on what we're doing right now that's causing suffering and how we may put an end to it. Not all craving is bad, but you have to remember craving is not one person. It's like you have lots of cravings in the mind, lots of different voices, lots of different attitudes. And that ability to sort out who you want to associate with outside and who you don't want to associate with outside has to be turned inside as well. Which cravings do you want to listen to? Which cravings do you have to put out in the doghouse? You pick up some of this from other people. And as the Buddha said, that second quality, the quality of appropriate attention, that's something you pick up from people who are wise. And you have to learn how to apply it inside, too. Make it your own. Appropriate attention means basically seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, where there's stress, what's causing the stress, seeing the possibility of having dispassion for that cause, and then having a strategy for how you're going to do that. That strategy is the path. This means looking at ourselves in a new way. If we have a very strong sense of, I am this, I have a unitary self that wants this and wants that, that's going to determine the imperatives in your life. But that's taking craving as our friend and totally trusting it. Whereas the Buddha says, if you look at most of your cravings, they're not really your true friends. They cause a lot of stress. And he has you look at that very carefully. Now, why does he have us look there? Because seeing the stress that we cause ourselves is one way of getting past the, a lot of the dishonesty in the mind. A lot of our cravings are the false friends who flatter and cajole. And we like people who flatter us. We like people who go along with our ideas, and as a result, we can end up causing a lot of trouble for ourselves and for other people. And it's very easy to ignore that. In fact, there's a common saying in Thailand is people have to really sense a certain amount of suffering in their lives before they're willing to practice. If they don't sense that. they're never really going to come to the practice. And you have to begin to see that it's not all caused by things outside. There's a lot you're doing inside right now, which is why you have to train the mind. 
without that training, the mind can just go blissfully on thinking that it's good and yet complaining about all the suffering and not being willing to see where there's the connection between what the mind is doing itself and the suffering that it's undergoing. It's when you finally realize that the problem isn't outside, the problem is inside. Those outside friends who may be leading you astray, they're not the real problem. It's your willingness to go along with them. And why are you willing? Because they happen to fall in line with a lot of your cravings. So you have to look carefully at these cravings that you have as your friends. Because some of them actually are true friends and some of them are not. And John Sawat used to say, this is our problem. We see craving as our friend and stress and suffering as our enemy. Of course, if we look carefully at stress and suffering, we discover it gives us good lessons. Now, to look at it, the mind has to be still. And to be still, it has to be, learn at least a few tricks about looking at its cravings with suspicion, learning how to put them aside, at least for the time being. Say, so let the mind just settle down right now. See where in the mind there is a craving for peace, there is a craving for stillness. Learn how to train that so that, as with all desire on the path, it actually is conducive to the states that you want and doesn't get in the way. The Buddha talks about having too little desire, too much desire, both being a problem. If there's too little desire, you just don't want to practice. If there's too much, all you can think about is how much you want the results. And you're not really focused on, well, what am I doing right now? What can I change? What's the actual path that will lead to the results? It's like seeing a city on the horizon that you want to go to and focusing all your attention on that as you're driving along. Of course, you're going to run into people or run off the road. You've got to focus your desire on staying on the road and being safe on the road. That's how you harness your desires and harness your cravings. As for the cravings that would pull you aside, learn how to put, put them aside for the time being. See them that they're they're like people coming along and saying, hey, let's go out and have a little something here. Let's go out and have a little fun. And you can remind yourself you've had that kind of fun many, many, many times before. There's nothing really new about it. It's here in the meditation that there's something new. In the beginning, it doesn't seem like much new at all. It's just breath coming in, breath going out, something you really know, you think. There's a lot more here than you see at the beginning. That's why you want to look more deeply into the breath, look more deeply into what, it is, what it's like for the mind to settle down and really feel secure here. As the Buddha says, we're, we're practicing, we're trying to see something we've never seen before. That means we have to do things we've never done before. A lot of our cravings are like old movies we've seen many, many times. Here's a chance to look for something new and to strengthen some of the cravings that have been pushed off into the background. Focus your craving on how I can get the mind down. How can I get the mind to feel at ease in the present moment? How can I get it to stay here with a sense of interest, a sense of well-being? Those are things we want. Well, how do you act skillfully on that desire? We're not trying to deny the desire. We're just trying to augment it with the other factors that are going to be needed. The desire there is part of right effort. But you have to be mindful. You have to be alert. You have to contemplate things, evaluate things. How is the breath going right now? How could I improve it when it feels good? How do I maintain that sense of comfort and not get too excited about it? Or when things are going well, how do you get not too blasé? A lot of this is a matter of finding the right balance, and having that sense of enough in an all-around way. The 
This is one of the reasons we come out to a place like this, where it's still so the friends that we've been associating with for so long, who may not be so helpful in the practice, can at least be further away. Of course, you look inside and you find you've internalized a lot of their ideas and values. But think of the image that Ajahn Chah had, that you've got a house, and the house has one seat, and so you're the one sitting in the seat, and everybody else has to stand. And because you're the owner of the house, you can tell the ones who are standing, okay, if you're not wanted here right now, you can go. They don't have any place to sit down. If they're sitting down in the seat and you're standing around, you're in a bad position. But now you're, you've got the seat here. And see so these other voices that come up, the other members of the committee, friends, true friends and false friends. You want to sort through them. And that practice of recognizing who's a true friend and who's not, both internally and externally. That takes care of a lot of the practice right there. And we use this principle of appropriate attention to sort these things out. Which friends are helping you understand the cause of stress, or help understand the problem of suffering? Which ones are trying to pull you in another way? Take that as your standard. And you find that the results will be good, both inside and out. <laughs>